Hail and Mercies. Welcome to the world of Baldur's Gate 3. It's me, the Spark King. And in today's video, I will show you super cool build for Astarion. Most of players who already beat Baldur's Gate 3 Honor mod would say Astarion Monk is the best. And they are right. But Astarion Open Hand Monk will be best only in the end game when you finish his quest. I like most stable builds that you can play always. They are effective, fun to play, so let's build it. And today I will be building Astarion as he should be, a rogue. But instead of starting with rogue, we will be starting as a ranger. He still can use kinda same weapons. As a ranger it doesn't matter what favorite enemy you will pick on level 1. We basically don't care about any favorite enemies, so I would stick with ranger knight. It will give us proficiency in heavy armor, so just by picking this feat, maybe you will find good heavy armor that your party don't need and you can equip. In Natural Explorer, I recommend picking something like Urban Tracker, if you will use Asterion as a trap disabler, lock picker, a robber, stealing items and other stuff. But if you just want him as party member who can be like powerful and take some damage, I recommend going with Wasteland Wanderer of Fire to gain resistance against fire damage. Like most of the very common damage in the game. For skill proficiency, I recommend going with athletics, stealth, and maybe something like nature or investigation. It doesn't matter too much. Now let's make our ability point distribution. It will be dexterity as main attribute. It affects our armor class, chances to hit, and damage with weapons. So dexterity 16, then constitution. It can be 16 too or just 14, depending on how much you will use your bow or your daggers. If you're going more in melee combat, then definitely get something like 16 in constitution. Other stats is not too important, but I recommend going with something like 12 into wisdom. It will affect our spells and our saving throws in wisdom. Strength is really nice too to be able to shove enemies. And then depending on what you like more, you can have 14 strength or 14 wisdom. So pretty balanced character, let's go. Asterion's main ability gives him chance to be happy. When he's happy, he gains plus one to attack rolls, saving throws, and most ability checks. What is most important is attack rolls. So with this build, I want to make as much attacks as possible with him. And with each attack, we will be doing a lot of additional damage. So let's talk about our levels. I recommend to stick with the ranger in the first half of the game. So level 2 will be a ranger. Our spells of choice, Hunter's Mark and Ensnaring Strike. Fighting style, 2 weapon fighting. This will add our ability modifier to damage of second weapon attack. On third level you can pick any spell you like, maybe you like some additional healing potions for free like Goodberry, you want to disable mages and long rage attackers used for cloud, or maybe you just want some additional exploration help so enhanced sleep will work. If your party don't have any long strider, mages who will buff for wall parties then definitely pick Volk's long strider. And on level 3 we're picking our subclass, so our subclass of choice will be Hunter. While Gloomstalker feels more Asterion-like subclass, I like to stick with Hunter. Asterion need to know how to hunt people, how to hunt animals, so Hunter is actually more accurate subclass for him in my opinion. And it's more powerful for our playstyle, because we're picking Hunter Spray Colossus Slayer. Once per turn, our weapon dealing additional 1d8 damage, if target below hit point maximum. Level 4, that's where we pick additional feat, our first feat. So, your feat of choice will be dependent on what armor you're using. If you're going with heavy armor, then definitely pick heavy armor master. This will decrease damage you take by 3. Very powerful feat. But I like to play this build more flexible way. That's why I'm going for ability improvement and we improve dexterity, our hit chance, our armor class and initiative. Now we're finally hitting level 5 and getting extra attack as ranger, so now we can use our action to attack two times. For our additional spell, on this level I recommend going with silence, it's very nice to be able to silence enemies or spike growth just to make some zones inaccessible for enemies, so you don't need to run and hunt them down. So what's our playstyle in early game? 
Basically, it's super easy and straightforward. You find your enemies from the distance. And on first round you can use Ensnaring Strike. If you're not planning to use heavy armor at all, then there's different feat when you're picking your first level, which will give enemies disadvantage on trying to get out of your Ensnaring Strike, so definitely pick this. This uses action and bonus action, and you want to use it if you're not in a range of melee attack. So just use Ensnaring Strike range, make enemies stuck in one place after hitting him, get your melee weapons and just come close to your enemy. While he ensnared, you will have advantage on attack rolls and easily destroy him. For early game I recommend finding short swords. And basically you're looking for weapons with finis label on them. These weapons will scale with dexterity instead of strength. So you can use your bow or you can use double short sword. Also you can use daggers of course, if you find some daggers with nice abilities. So basically in 3 rounds we're scaling like that, one attack with a bow, then hunter's mark and two attacks with main hand attack, and on third turn you can do two attacks with main hand and one bonus action attack with offhand weapon. While doing additional 1d8 from second turn from Colossus Slayer and additional 1d6 each attack from second turn from Hunter's Mark. That's really nice and incredible damage for early game. Now let's finish our character. On level 6, Ranger don't have a lot of cool stuff. New favorite enemy, so here's Bounty Hunters that I told you about. You can use it for more successful ensnaring strikes with your bow, or you can have additional uh, resistance to a cold or poison damage type. But instead of we're going to rogue now. So level 6, we're switching to rogue. With rogue, get sleight of hand, stealth, and acrobatics. Then one more level into rogue, and we're getting dash, disengage, and hide as bonus action. And one more level into rogue to pick our subclass. It will be thief rogue. Now we get an additional bonus action. And on level 8 already, we can do 4 attacks in a turn. 2 with offhand weapon attack with 2 bonus actions and 2 with our action. That's insane. And basically we're finishing with rogue now. We get an additional feat. Again, rules are the same. If you're using heavy armor, go for heavy armor master. I'm suggesting you pick an exactly this build without heavy armor master and instead pick an ability point improvement, maxing out our dexterity to 20. Then level 5 rogue will give us uncanny touch, which will half the damage we take. It's already really hard to hit us, we got really high dexterity, really high armor class. Now, if someone hit us, we will reduce damage taken. Then level 6 rogue, and we pick in acrobatics and perception skills. And we're finishing as level 7 rogue at level 12. So why I'm focusing too much on rogue? Because sneak attack scales with rogue levels, and just sneak attack alone with this build will do something from 17 to 51 damage. But if you ascend your Axtarion on his quest, it will do 1d10 more damage. That's actually even more insane. So what we get on items for this bad boy? Because we're doing so much attacks each turn, I think best idea is to go for lowering our critical strike rolls needed to increase chance of critical strike. So Servok Horned Helmet will reduce this number by 1. Additionally, we can't be frightened, so it's pretty nice. Cloak slot is not too important, you can go with something like Cloak of Protection for additional armor class, Cloak of Displacement will work too, or just any cloak you like. Late game armor, it will be medium armor, armor for agility, but you can find kinda similar armor early in the game from the shops. Look for this exotic material label. You will add your full dexterity modifier to your armor class, and this armor won't impose disadvantage on stealth ability checks. So now you can be stealthy, and additionally you will add full dexterity to your armor class. And as you can see, our armor class is 24 flat. That's insane, considering we're using no shield at all. For our gloves, I recommend Helldusk gloves for this build, basically because our weapon attacks will deal additional 1d6 fire damage. You can have slightly worse version of these gloves from the start of Act 2, which will give 1d4 fire damage. They will call it Float Helldusk gloves. Boot slot doesn't matter too much, so boots of persistence, really nice stuff, uh, freedom of movement and long strider, 
included to your like build always. So it's a nice buffs, additional movement speed. You don't need to cast it. Freedom of movement can be paralyzed. Then our weapons. Orange knife, really late game weapon. It will reduce number to roll critical hit by one, so really powerful one. And when you hit creatures with this knife, they will receive vulnerability to piercing damage. So they will take double damage. And you want to take this knife in your main hand. And in the offhand, you want to have Knife of Undermountain King. This again will reduce number to roll for critical hit. Have really nice plus two enchantment. So really best dagger for your offhand if you're going for reducing critical strike number build. For our bow, of course, it will be dead shot. Easy to get, you can buy it in up three. Again, reduce the number to hit critical strike. And now we're rolling crits when we're hitting at least 16 on dice. But most important stuff for this build is our cheerily combination. Broadmother's Revenge. Whenever you healed, your weapon coated in poison, and it still an additional 1d6 poison damage. Strange Conduit Ring. While concentrating on a spell, you do an additional 1d4 psychic damage. And Hunter's Mark is concentration spell. Ensnaring Strike is concentration spell. Spike Gross is concentration spell. So all your spells is concentration spells. Just cast your favorite and do additional damage. And last ring is Caustic Band. So I recommend in Caustic Band to deal additional acid damage. And it's flat, flat to damage, very nice. In case you have Cleric who can heal you in a fight, or if you wish to use Healing Potion just before entering a fight. It's really easy done, I will show you in a second. But in case you don't want to use potions or you don't have cleric, switch caustic band for ring of regeneration. This ring will activate and heal you for 1d4 hit points each round. But most importantly, healing will cause the Brutmar's Revenge to activate. So I guess it's time to showcase damage of this bad boy. The best way to play this style is to actually start fighting with your teammates. So let's start fight with Iron Candle Brown. While you ally in a fight, it's easy to just use your height action. And now you can just use your potion basically for free without using any extra action and coat your weapon in poison. It will affect all your weapons, even your bow and two hand and weapons in two hands. And our idea is to basically use uh, potion and then use our bonus action to cast Hunter's Mark on our enemy of choice. Or you can start with Incinerating Strike, it will use action and bonus action, and you can cast Hunter's Mark with additional bonus action, depending on your distance to enemies. So as you can see, weapon, weapon is coated and we're doing a lot of additional damage. But we are not in a sneak mode, that's why it's nice to focus down targets that is nearby of your teammates. This will trigger sneak attack for insane amount of damage, but don't forget, we're using two weapons, so Torgel Dual Wielding, very like powerful button, you need to Torgel it off all the time when you're controlling your character. This will give ability to make one attack, then you can make this attack to another target, and then you can just distribute your offhand attacks. Another cool tip is to go to reactions and to actually press ask on sneak attacks. So maybe you don't want to trigger it on the first hit. Maybe you want to trigger it on second hit on another target. So it's nice to dodge it on and off. But for demonstration reasons, I will turn on this dual wielding stuff and attack this guy. He got low hit points. But after every turn, before pressing end turn, you want to turn it on. Because when enemies run away from you and provoking opportunity attacks, you will do two attacks instead of one if it's turned on. Very useful tip. So let's see damage. Oh, that's crazy. Okay, let's see. So we're doing our main hand attack 1d4 from dagger, plus 2, plus 5 from our dexterity modifier, plus 1d6 from hunter's mark. Then additional necrotic damage. You will get it from Asterion. It will be 1d10 instead of 1d4, so it's even more damage. Then 1d6 from poison amulet, then flat 2 from ring, 1d6 from gloves, 1d4 from ring, and additional 1d8 from colossus slayer, because he was not on full health. And that's only one attack, you can make four of them. And each attack will do same damage, only colossus slayer will be falling off. And that's not it, because then on one of attack 
you can make this 4 to 6 piercing damage from your sneak attack. And maybe it's not looking like too much of damage for someone, but I remind you. At the same time, you're getting vulnerability on your targets. And this means all piercing damage is doubled. And don't forget, while you're getting limited spell slots, after you kill target and use Hunter's Mark on this target, you can use another Hunter's Mark without using spell slots, if you keep in your concentration. Just make sure to use Reapply Hunter's Mark instead of normal Hunter's Mark. And our chances to roll a critical hit is really high. Critical hit sneak attacks hitting for double damage. So now this guy got piercing vulnerability. And our damage is really crazy. Hitting us is really a hard task, but even if someone hitting us, it's really low damage. So this Asterion is definitely a nice addition to your party, with crazy critical hits. And that's what I'm talking about. I used only two attacks and already did almost 100 damage. Because you're rolling even Colossus Slayer with 2d8 instead of 1d8. And all other damage dices on critical hit rolled with two dices instead of one. So 2d6 fire damage from gloves, 2d4 psychic from ring, and 2d8 from Colossus Slayer, which is increased by x2 for vulnerability of target. And that's why I like to use sneak attack on this tap with reaction. So I'm using it on critical hits to do even more damage. As you can see, 8d6 doubled. So damage numbers is actually insane. It's fun, easy to play, and a really nice damaging class. Combine this Astarion with a party who can do another piece in damage. So another bow user, maybe a spear user, or other piece in damage types. And he will become your favorite party member. I hope you enjoyed this build, and see you in the next videos, guys.